and we are live what's happening everyone welcome back to the punch perfect boxing channel today i'm going to be doing my punch perfect preview and prediction for a 12 round lightweight clash this saturday night in las vegas between william zapeda and maxi hughes live on the zone i'm really looking forward to this fight it's two top 10 lightweights going at it obviously william zapeda is much higher rated and has a much higher ceiling and is expected to go on and win a world title at lightweight then move up a division and win a world title as well and who knows where he could go from there but william zapeda is the a side in this fight but maxi hughes has cemented himself as a top 10 lightweight with some brilliant wins an unlucky defeat last time out against George Cambosis Jr. as well so Maxi Hughes is firmly in that top 10 as well at the worst the top 15 so I think it's an interesting matchup for William Zapeda it's not the most accomplished fighter that he's faced you'd argue Jojo Diaz is that but I think in terms of a peak lightweight I think Maxi Hughes is probably the best lightweight that he's faced I think it's going to be an interesting matchup to see how he deals with it as always, we'll talk about each fighter and then we'll move on to talk about the fight itself and how I'm breaking it down and how I think it will eventually play out. We're going to start today by talking about Maxi Hughes and talk a bit about that Cinderella journey. And I asked myself the question in preparation for recording this breakdown, you know, what's my earliest memory of Maxi Hughes? And you know, the strongest memory that came to mind is the first time that I ever watched him live. So... To give you a bit of background and, and a story that kind of shows sort of how deep into boxing I've been for a very long time. Back in 2013, Matchroom had a show at the Winter Gardens in Blackpool. Now, if you think that, you know, Matchroom had a show at the Winter Gardens in Blackpool and it's headlined by Brian Rose, it's kind of showed how far Matchroom have come along their journey because you'd never get that nowadays. And if you did, it was a next gen show and, and you kind of, you know, just accept that it's a weaker car because it's supposed to be the next generation. But that was back in 2013 and Brian Rose was the headliner. And back then Matchroom weren't this big global company. Obviously Barry Hearn had built the Matchroom brand. But in boxing they weren't this huge organisation just yet. They weren't a global brand. And their Facebook page was pretty modest at the time. And they used to run competi uh, competitions to win free tickets to their shows. And I used to comment on all of them. And then this one time... They probably got sick of me and thought we'll just give him shows to the Blackpool card that no one wants. So I got an, uh, uh, an inbox on Facebook from the Matchroom page that said you've won two free tickets. I begged my dad to drive me up to Blackpool so we could go to the show. At the time I was a massive Lee Selby fan and he was on the undercard so I kind of you know used that as the, uh, the proposition for my dad to take me up to Blackpool because I was 15 at the time, I had no money and I couldn't travel my own way up there so needed his help to, uh, to get me there and shout out dad because he did that. And then on the undercard, obviously you had Lee Selby, Brian Rose was the headliner, but you had a central area title fight between two unbeaten lightweights, which I remember at the time Eddie Hearn spoke about this fight like it was a real trade fight and everyone should really be excited about it. And it was Scotty Cardell against Maxi Hughes for the central area lightweight title, both unbeaten. And Scott Cardell was viewed as the favourite heading in, he was the guy that was getting the push from Matram. And ultimately, I think that's what won in the fight because it was very close. It was very competitive over 10 rounds. But Scotty Cardle got the nod. But I think Maxi Hughes was the victim of being the B-side that night. But from there, I thought, you know, he was quite valiant in defeat. I, you know, it was a name that I thought I'll remember him going forwards. But if you'd have said to me then, and that was in April of 2013, I think it was April 20th to be exact, but I could be wrong. If you'd have said to me there and then, 10 years from now, he'll be, you know, fighting over in the States against a former unified uh, world champion in a massive fight, aka George Cambosis, I'd have said to you, nah, no chance. You know, I've just seen him lose for a central area title. There's no way he'll go on to do anything like that, especially 10 years from now, which is a long way away. And fast forward 10 years, and that's exactly what he did against George Cambosis, and now he's in a big fight in Las Vegas as well this weekend, 11 years on. So I think it's crazy the journey Maxi Hughes has been on. And after that Liam Walsh defeat, I think for Maxi, he probably felt that his career was over. I know that he went through some sort of family turmoil around that time as well. But a big upset win over John O'Carroll just sparked things into life for him. And then he got a win against the unbeaten Kazakh, whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce because I'll butcher the video. But went in and got another big win, so back-to-back -back big victories, and then went in with Paul Highland and dealt with him really comfortably as well. And it was just kind of like, okay, this this ball's rolling. That's that's kind of three fights where you maybe expect him to lose, and he's gone in there and got the win. And John O'Carroll, you know, was coming off that big win over Scott Quigg, uh, the Kazakh that he thought was unbeaten and had a bit of a reputation. You know, Paul Highland was seen as a domestic level opponent, but still a good win for Maxi, who we didn't really know kind of what his level was at that stage. And then he gets matched against Giovanni Straffon, who 
absolutely annihilated James Tennyson, who Eddie Hearn was building up as the, the Irish Golovkin and the lightweight Golovkin and all that rubbish, the Irish Tank Davis or whatever they were calling him. And Strathon just went through and absolutely blitzed him. And heading into that Maxi Hughes fight, there were many people that thought the same was going to happen. But I'd been so impressed with Maxi on that run and probably going back all those years where I'd quite a high opinion of him anyway. I fancied him to beat Strathon and I took the odds on him to win. And he schooled him for 12 rounds, beat him easily. And from there, you're like, okay, you know, what more can he can he go on and do here? He's just been brilliant. He's been sensational the way he's just continuously stepped up, stepped up, and has won well. He hasn't scraped through these fights. So really impressed with him. Then gets, uh, and you know, from there, Matrim are willing to put him in, you know, consistently big fights from that stage. We saw him get in with Ryan Walsh, and that was a competitive fight, but again, he won that well enough. We saw him get in with Kid Galahad, and that was the fight that I think many people maybe expected him to come unstuck because Kid Galahad had been at world level before. That was a very messy, ugly fight that was difficult to score, as some Kid Galahad fights are. But Maxi Hughes was able to come out on top. I think he just showed a little bit more intent and willingness to try and win the fight. And that's kind of worked a trick against Kid Galahad before. We saw that with his stable mate, uh, Josh Warren, when he got the win over Kid Galahad as well. So he was just reeling off big wins. And the kind of the brighter the lights and the bigger the stage that Matram were then giving him, he was just continuing to deliver and continuing to perform. So Maxi Hughes was going on this great run. But you felt like, OK, that's earned him... One of those big names now. He'll be a keep busy fight for uh, George Cambosis, for uh, Shakur Stevenson, for one of these top lightweights. He will be a keep busy fight for them. Ryan Garcia was mentioned a lot. There was a lot of talk about Ryan Garcia versus Maxi Hughes for a period as well. And it kind of felt like, okay, that's where he'll just come unstuck, get beat, and then he'll just go back down to domestic European level. But he gets the George Cambosis opportunity. And as a heavy underdog, George Cambosis obviously had been the unified champion with that big upset win over Teofimo Lopez, had lost twice to Devin Haney, but Devin Haney's gone on to be one of the best pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the sport. So you expected George Cambosis to win. And Maxi Hughes, I'll tell you now, won that fight. Maxi Hughes should have got the nod over in America. It was bitterly disappointing for him because it felt like all that work that he'd been doing, this wasn't a one-off fight that he'd been given and produced the best performance of his career and got unlucky. He'd earned that opportunity. He'd earned that fight. And he deserved to win it as well. So it was gutting to see Maxi lose in that way. George Cambosis came away with a lucky result and now gets the opportunity against Vasily Lomachenko for a world title. So it just shows those fine margins. And Maxi's now having to get in with someone that is very dangerous in William Zapeda and could make Maxi Hughes look very easy and make Maxi Hughes look very average. And that's not really the case. And I think it's just harsh and it shows the fine margins in sport and in boxing, you know, that, that win that can be taken away from you can result in you not getting those big opportunities and end up with harder opportunities. But nonetheless, a big opportunity for him again against William Zapeda. If he can win, I mean, it will be impossible then to deny him a world title shot. And I think before where he was seen as a keep busy fight for some of those top lightweights, I think people would then view him as, OK, that's a, that's a, you know, a, a credible um, you know title defence. That's a credible opponent for me to take on in the interim. So... I think that Maxi Hughes has had a wonderful career. I think it's been brilliant to see how he's turned it around because domestically he looked done. But the fact that he's moved up to lightweight and just been brilliant, to be honest with you, that's the only way I can put it. I think it's really special. And if he were to win this weekend, I'm not a big supporter of British boxers. I'd love to see Maxi Hughes win. I think it would be brilliant. And I think he deserves it. And I think he deserved it against George Cambosis. And that was taken away from him. But Matt Hughes has had a brilliant career and I've followed him for a very long time. Moving on to talk about William Zapeda. This guy is one of my favourite fighters in boxing right now because he has such a unique style. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But I feel like for Zapeda now, he's kind of right on the doorstep of a world title shot. But we need to see him in with those kind of elite guys for him to win one. I feel like we've seen him in with some world-class super featherweights. And we've seen him come through those fights against Rene Alvarado, for example. We've seen him in against Jojo Diaz. And at the time, Jojo Diaz hadn't gone on this awful run that he's been on of late. And many people thought that, you know, Jojo Diaz gave Devin Haney some issues. Could this potentially be a tricky fight for William Zapeda? And William Zapeda made it look easy. Now, Zapeda's had some performances that have been a little bit patchy. But I think when he's been asked to step up, we've seen the best of him. But some of it's been world-class super featherweight opposition or just super featherweight opposition. We kind of need to see him in now against one of those top lightweights. And I feel like Maxi Hughes at the minute is that. But with Zapeda's ceiling and his potential and the expectation of him, 
perhaps we even see him being a step above Maxi Hughes and maybe we need to see him in with someone even better at this stage as well. But nonetheless, Zepeda's a brilliant fighter. And what I love about Zepeda is that I feel in boxing there's kind of a trade-off between do you prioritise power and aggression or do you prioritise volume? And a lot of fighters throw lots of punches but don't necessarily hurt their opponents. They can overwhelm them and they can stop people by sort of raining down shots and you know just overwhelming their opponents and they can't defend them. But you don't often find a lot of volume punches that are big power punches. Now you get some that are heavy handed and then just throwing lots of punches hurts. You know, Sabriel Mateus isn't a big one punch knockout artist. But he's got heavy hands and he throws lots of punches. Even someone like Artur Baterbiev, you know, can throw a lot of punches, but because his hands are so heavy, it hurts. But more often than not, you get a lot of fighters that throw a lot of punches, but they're more stinging and they're just doing that because they want to be busy and that's their style. And then you'll get other fighters that choose to be sort of more single shot. They'll look to generate power. They want to get their timing perfect. They want to be able to hurt their opponents and suck the life out of their opponents with every single shot. And... More often than not, you tend to get one or the other. So Pader's both in one, and it's so unique. Just watching him, Southpaw throws tons of punches, but he means every single shot. They're all hard, he puts everything into every punch, and it's unique to see someone be able to combine those two traits and those two styles, because rarely do we see that. And I think that's one of the reasons that makes Pader so unique and makes him a bad stylistic matchup for a lot of top fighters. You know, you look at someone like Shakur Stevenson, for example, who has perhaps struggled with power punches where it's made him a little bit tentative. And he's perhaps also struggled with other southpaws. Sometimes he's sort of cancelled himself out against other southpaws. You know, maybe struggled a little bit as well against guys maybe that have enough volume, volume and consistency in their work. You know, Zepeda combines all of those things. And you look at Zepeda and may go, well, he gets beat by, I don't know, maybe Tank Davis and Devin Haney and maybe those fighters. But... Fighters that are on that level, like Shakur Stevens, maybe he's just perfect to beat him. So he's got one of those styles where I think Zapeda is going to be a dangerous proposition for certain fighters on the world scene. At 135 pounds and at 140 pounds, I think he's got the shape and the build and the physique to move up to 140 as well one day. So I think Zapeda is a brilliant fighter. I think he's very exciting, and I think there's so many good fights for him to come. But after Maxi Hughes, I don't think he should stay at Maxi Hughes level or kind of drop down again. I'd like to see it from there. Has to be a world title shot. Whether that's forcing a title shot against WBC champion Shakur Stevenson or waiting to see what happens with the other belts in the wake of Devin Haney vacating them all. He needs to needs to take that jump. He needs to get in there with the, the next guy because he'll only get left behind. You know, you look at that lightweight division now and talk about the landscape quickly. You know, Javante Davis, now the WBA champion, he's going to be taking on Frank Martin. That's two top 10 lightweights going at it. Shakur Stevenson's kind of waiting for an opponent at the minute, but he's the WBC champ. It's likely that he'll fight the winner of Cambosas versus Loma in a unification, or he'll fight uh, Navarrete, who's moving up to challenge for the vacant WBO title. So it feels like everyone's busy, and if Zepeda doesn't act quickly, he'll kind of get left out, and he'll just be waiting for an opportunity, and maybe has to move up in weight, and go and fight Ryan Garcia maybe, or, what, or whatever, or Arnold Barbosa, or one of these... A golden Boy guys at 140 pounds, but I just don't want him to miss the boat because Golden Boys sometimes do that with their fighters, whether it be Virgil Ortiz or Jaime Munguia or even Ryan Garcia to an extent. Sometimes they miss the boat with their best talents and they shouldn't do that with Zapata. But I think he's a brilliant fighter. So getting into the, the prediction and the breakdown part of it, how do I see this fight playing out? I think what Maxi Hughes is brilliant at is kind of intercepting his opponent's rhythm. And what I mean by that is he's very good at understanding, okay, this is when my opponent throws and this is when he takes a step off. And what Maxi does brilliantly is he kind of waits for you to throw and he'll defend it. And then that split second where he has an opportunity, he makes it count. He has very tit-for-tat fights. And I think if you sort of fight in sequences and fight in stages... He's very good at just sort of dropping himself in between those gaps and in between those stages and getting his own work done. And he has very tit-for-tat fights and he's able to kind of intercept your rhythm, get his work done, then defend what's coming back, then get... And it feels like he's always kind of that step ahead and getting the advantage on you. And I think Maxi Hughes has done that brilliantly. And if you're someone that is maybe a counter-puncher, maybe you're a boxer-puncher, Maxi has a very good style to be able to deal with that because he does just kind of drop into those pockets. He's 
almost in a kind of football or soccer sense, kind of that number 10 that kind of drops into these little positions that are very hard to sort of intercept and defend. And he's very good at just kind of popping up in the right places, Maxi. Nothing jumps off the screen at you when you watch him. He's not got stupidly fast hands. He's not technically brilliant. He's not a massive puncher. He's not really a puncher at all. But he's just very well-rounded and got a solid skill set. And I think he's very smart and he's a very switched on fire. And he's just good at identifying opportunities and getting himself within the rhythm of his opponent and within the rhythm of the fight and using his his style and his moments to pick up those opportunities. And I think that's what makes Maxi such an effective fighter. But I do feel what I will say about Maxi is although he's fought an array of styles, you know, Kid Galahad, a technical switch hitter with an awkward style, uh, to Strafon, who's a Mexican come forward all action fighter, to Ryan Walsh, who's kind of more sort of you know, kind of technical but can be aggressive and can work in different ways. He's fought an array of styles, so I'm not saying that, you know, he's necessarily fought the same style and that's why he's had a lot of success, but I feel like he hasn't fought someone that's quite unique and I feel that's the difference with Zapeda. So the reason I think William Zapeda is going to cause him issues is because that rhythm and that flow that I'm talking about, that there isn't really that with Zapeda. It's just constant and he doesn't throw three or four punches and then wait for a return from Maxi. He'll throw seven or eight punches, committed shots, and that's going to force Maxi to defend a lot more in this fight, I feel. And when Maxi kind of puts those hands up against a pay it's just target practice, and he'll just unload, and he'll find ways to the body. He's a brilliant body puncher. He'll find ways around the sort of around the elbows to the side and through the middle, and then that'll open up different opportunities for him. I just feel Maxi's been really good, at, and, and George Cambosis is kind of the perfect opponent for him where... George will kind of attack and then take a break and then that gives Maxi an opportunity to pounce and it becomes tit for tat. Zapeda's not a tit for tat fighter. It's kind of 90-10 in his favour. He attacks, he's dominant in his attacks and then when he kind of step off you haven't really got the opportunity then to make it count. And I feel where Maxi's been brilliant at kind of intercepting the rhythm of his opponents and finding the, the, the flow and kind of getting himself in the flow and matches his opponents so he can counter... There isn't going to be those opportunities with Zepeda. His style throws all that out the window. He's a southpaw. There's a lot of punches. And Maxi can throw a lot of punches, but Zepeda's going to double it if you look at the punch stats. I think this is just a bad style for Maxi where he's never going to quite figure it out. And I think this is just a bridge too far for him. Do I think it goes the distance or do I think it gets stopped? I think Maxi's incredibly tough. We've seen that even in his defeats. But I don't think he's ever fought someone quite as big and quite as strong as Zapeda. And I think he's going to be forced to tuck up and defend a lot. While Zapeda sometimes has a habit of going the distance when you don't expect it, Jojo Diaz very tough. Maxi very tough. So do I see similarities there? I do. But I think Maxi's not going to quite have any opportunities for offense going to have to defend a lot and I think that could lead to a late stoppage so I'm kind of torn between Zapeda between round 7 and 12 and points I do think he's going to put a lot of pressure on Maxi late on in the fight Maxi's just going to have to cover up and defend it really comes down to how much punishment he can absorb I'm going to say Zapeda between 7 and 12 but it wouldn't surprise me if it's a points decision but either way I see it being quite dominant for Zapeda Big fan of Maxi. I spoke about him highly. I've actually fancied him to do well in fights. People thought he wouldn't. I picked him to beat Strathon. I thought he'd give Cambosis problems. But this, I just feel like, is a bad matchup all round. So I'm going for Williams of Hader to win. Let me know your thoughts down below, guys. Any other predictions you want to see this week? Thanks for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time.